Hello. <laughs> Hi, Magdalene. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing pretty well, thanks. Um, wow, so here we are. This is uh, our first um, live conversation at the Gardener, our first uh, live chat. We're um, calling this, uh, this first in the series, we're calling the series Three Works. And, um, and it's great, uh, great to be here with you today. Thanks. Absolutely. So my name is uh, Sequoia Miller and I'm Chief Curator at the Gardner Museum. And I thank everyone for joining us um, this afternoon. As I just mentioned, it's our first live program. So we're really excited about it. You can expect a few bumps. Um, so please be <laughs> patient with us if they arise. Um, uh, today, uh, artist Magdalene Dixter, who you should see on your screen alongside me, will be joining, um, be joining us for a conversation about three of her artworks. The plan is for Magdalene and I to talk for about 20 minutes or so, and then to open it up for questions for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, as you'll notice, your, um, as participants, your cameras are turned off and your mics are muted, and also the chat option is disabled. We're very eager to hear from you though, um, and questions for Magdalene uh, can be sent uh, through the Q&A function. So at the bottom of your um, Zoom screen, as you highlight the, the features, one of those is Q&A. And at any time, you can go ahead and type a question into that Q&A. Um, and it would be great to get as many as we can into the conversation. So um, I encourage questions. And I also want to note that the program is being streamed and recorded. So. Uh, let's see. Um, before we begin um, uh, the conversation with Magdalene, um, I, I would like to say a couple of things. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that The Gardener has been closed to the public since March 14th, so that's just over three months now, uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, the global pandemic has brought many unexpected changes to all of our lives, I think. Um, However, we do recognize that the physical, mental, and financial implications of the pandemic affect historically disenfranchised groups more severely. As an institution that supports and strives to support artists, we recognize the negative impact of COVID has had on our community. Um, and this includes canceled exhibitions, working from home with limited spaces and resources, for some folks no access to a studio, and of course, precarious employment. In the past three months, uh, we at The Gardener have continued to reflect uh, as an institution about our role in addressing relevant and global issues. We uh, individually and as a community stand in solidarity with Black communities and are committed to making the links between urgent conversations about police brutality, anti-Black racism, equality, and our museum's role in society. These commitments are intertwined with anti-racist and decolonial work that is necessary in working towards reconciliation. We acknowledge that Toronto is located on the treaty lands and ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Petun, and the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation. The community we work in is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and I am grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this land. Thanks. Okay, so we're here with Magdalene. Um, our, as I've mentioned, our first presenter um, in the three work series is Magdalene Dextra. Magdalene is a first generation Egyptian Canadian artist and her work has been exhibited internationally and is included in collections around the world, including The Gardener. Magdalene lives uh, in the Niagara region of Ontario where she is a passionate artist educator teaching at secondary and post-secondary levels. Magdalene's work, uh, Polyanthroponemia, which we'll be talking about in just a few minutes, is one of four installations in the exhibition Raw at the Gardener. Uh, the exhibition is generous, generously supported by Kim Spencer McPhee Barristers PC in the Rooney Family Foundation. And when the museum reopens soon, we will um, resume Raw in our exhibition gallery and uh, you'll be able to come and see it in person. So again, Magdalene, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, why don't, okay, so now what we'll do is I am going to start uh, sharing my screen so that we can start to look at your images. So this will take us just a second. Okie doke. Here we go. I'm gonna go into a full view. Great. So I'm hoping that folks are able to, um, to see the screen here. Oh, 
is my next work. Looking forward to talking about that one too. Um, so well, why don't we start off with um, <laughs> talking about polyanthroponemia. So um, I think that maybe I'll describe this work and then I'll ask you a question, uh, you know, a couple of questions about it. So what we're looking at sure. in the image here, um, this is uh, an image from the Gardner's Exhibition Gallery. This is our ex uh, one wall of the exhibition hall, and it is about 20 feet tall or so. So the scale of this um, piece, object, installation is, is rather large. And so we're looking at wall and at these um, almost what, what seem like and what look like life forms that are um, attached to, growing out of, connected to, inhabiting, inhabiting the wall. The, the piece reads almost as a, as like a microbial, micro, as a, as a bacterium, as a microbiome. Um, it's like this, uh, this life form that has, in, that is infesting the museum and it's kind of coming out of the top of the wall a little bit and you can kind of see on the bottom there that it's coming out from the bottom and it has this implication of growth to it, which was part of our original plan, which we can talk about in a little bit. Um, I'd like to start off by asking you about the title of the work, Polyanthroponemia. Mm -hmm. Can you can you um, say what uh, sort of what the title's about, what it means, where it comes from? Probably an unfamiliar word to most folks. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so polyanthroponemia is a term coined by uh, James Lovelock, who is a, an independent uh, scientist and environmentalist out of the UK. Um, in talking about uh, climate change and our impact on the earth, he coined this term and broke it down as poly referencing many, anthro uh, referencing humans, and panemia referencing um, is the suffix of a disease. Uh, so polyanthropanemia is the term he coined to um, talk about the sort of viral like impact that humans have uh, on the earth. Our we have a sort of a theme structuring our conversation today, which is poly, I suppose, <laughs> or multiplicity is how, how we describe that. Um, so many humans um, are a disease on the earth in a sense. The, it seems to me that with this piece here, uh, initially anyway, we're encouraging us as viewers or folks experiencing the work to think of or to consider um, human presence on the planet as an infestation in a way. Does that sound right to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. How, how did you um, how did you start thinking about this, and and how do you kind of come to terms with your own relationship to um, to sort of being a living being on the earth, or sort of part of the infestation, so to speak? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I first started thinking about the idea of the human species as an infestation, um, really through reading James Lovelock's works and and reading his um, his Gaia theory posits that the earth isn't dead matter, that we can move here and there and use as we like. A living system composed of multiple intertwined living systems. Um, and then looking back uh, through my, my um, evolving understanding of our impact in terms of climate change, um, it, uh, it really resonated with me, the idea that we've, we've basically been, um, we've spread too far, we've grown too, too much. Um, so um, that's how I came to the thinking of the human species turning more into a malignant infestation rather than a cohabitating species. Um, you asked a second question, but I don't remember what it was. How you think about your own uh, your own sort of participation in the infestation? In yeah, sense. yeah, it's um, so I have uh, since first um, generating the idea for this installation. I've been thinking more about um, each cell that composes my installations, each cell as representative of an individual. So um, my work is very much um, motivated by thinking about how do I fit into the big picture um, to consider being one cell in 
the vastness of this installation, the vastness of other of my works. Um, it's humbling, but at the same time, it doesn't take out any of the uh, responsibility that I have as an individual participating in this massive organism that we are. Um, and so it's something I, I'm still reckoning with. Um, this is a little off topic, but um, particularly in, in response to all the social activism that is really exploding right now. Um, I know deeply that I need to be a part of that movement, part of the Black Lives Matter movement, the movement to support indigenous lives. Um, but it's balanced with a, a sometimes crippling sense of how small I am, how uh, an understanding of how insignificant I am. But uh, um, to bring it back to this work, um, it's very similar. Like I am very aware that I personally have an impact in my own sphere of operation, but also um, an impact in the way I'm connected to all the systems that I'm a part of. Yeah, it's a funny, it's a, it's a hard, I think, often um, sort of reconciling of the individual and the collective in a sense, yeah. right? And um, one thing I think that, that we get when we experience this work, um, especially close up, is that, is that I guess you, it's so, I, one thing that I love about it is that you can focus on any one tiny little aspect of it and it sort of explodes out in your imagination and each piece is is kind of like humans or kind of like any life form is exactly the same but completely different too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and sort of understanding those different kind of right registers maybe of um, mm -hmm. a focus or, or something, it's really, mm -hmm. and, and also the difference between like, I, you know, you've, you, you mentioned this idea of humans turning into a malignant force in a sense on the planet or relative to the planet. The notion of that, uh, of a, of a de degree of sort of the effectiveness of a different of scale of multiplicity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which is pertinent to the protest too, 100%, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Like how many people in who's, who's part of the multiplicity speaks directly to what the, what the effect of the work is, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think another, another question around this work for me has to do with, um, with the multiplicity, and, and you've kind of hit on this a little bit with your <laughs> with your referencing of the protests, is the idea of multiple identities and sort of multiple sources for our identities. Mm -hmm. So when I introduced you, I introduced you as a uh, first generation Egyptian Canadian, right? So there's, I guess, three identities emb <laughs> embedded into that phase. You're also mm -hmm. a woman, sometimes um, kind of woman artist. You're also a ceramic artist. Mm -hmm. And thinking about how these multiple identities of yours intersect with each other and how they become, um, to what extent or in what ways they become evident in the work. Um, thinking both about uh, polyanthroponemia that we're looking at now, but also actually at, what, at what's behind you. And I'm sort of curious about what's behind you too. It's not officially one of our three works, yeah. but it would be cool <laughs> to hear you sneaky, say. <laughs> sneaky slide in. <laughs> yeah. So can, so can you, can you say um, something about how your, um, your, your multiple identities sort of factor into your work and, and how, um, how you think about that as you're working and then after, uh, as you look at your work as it exists? Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of new reflection. So uh, it's, it, it might be a bit sloppy the way it comes out of my mouth, but um, something I've been realizing being um, a first generation child, uh, a child of immigrant parents. So my parents both came over from Egypt, I think in the seventies, um, when Canada's immigration policy started to open up more to people who didn't look like, um, white Canada. <laughs> um, and, uh, interestingly, my husband is also a first generation uh, immigrant, but he's the child of Dutch parents. So it's, it's interesting to compare our experiences. Um, my parents uh, were of a generation that uh, really focused on assimilating and blending in and becoming part of the country that they chose, the, their second home, their second country. Um, and so I was 
never raised to see myself as different. And I mean that as a positive and as a negative. Um, so for example, I am only now starting to learn more about what it means to be the Egyptian part of Egyptian Canadian. Uh, and that's a very, very new journey for me. I, I like maybe took one step into that journey. Um, and uh, I think there's something in this work about, like, like I said, I think about each cell as one individual. And I think there's something in this work um, that's reflecting on feeling lost in the, in the massive uh, community that we are and whatever community you want to talk about. Like if I'm thinking about it as um, lost in the Ontario community or the Niagara community. Um, and there's sort of a camouflage that I think is happening as well. Like each cell on its skin uh, in this work is the same at this, it, it looks similar at the surface. Um, and so I, I've been starting to reflect on um, how that might be coming from me feeling just go ahead and blend in, like don't be different, just follow along, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, uh, I've been thinking in, some of my newer explorations in the studio about um, maybe combining different clay bodies to reference uh, different communities coming together um, while still maintaining that aesthetic of many small individuals combining to make the community, combining to make the hoard. Um, yeah, so that's what I've been thinking about lately in terms of how my identity uh, might relate to what's going on in the studio. Wow, yeah, thank, thanks for that. The, um, I think it's great to bring the word camouflage into the conversation. Um, it's a, a really, I think, interesting counterpoint to the idea of assimilation in a way, which I think is sort of um, part of the discourse around immigration um, and identity, of course. But this notion of camouflage, I think, um, speaks in some way to the, um, to the dynamic status of all of these um, sort of sources of understanding ourselves, mm -hmm. Egyptian, Canadian artists, ceramic artists, whatever gender, um, mm -hmm. and, and the ways in which we sort of peel them on and peel them off in, yeah. in some sense, or um, kind of are more or less aware of them in, in other senses. Mm -hmm. um, and it also makes me think of the masks that, you know, you and I aren't wearing right now because we're in our homes or studios or whatever, mm -hmm. right? But the masks that so many of us are wearing in public and what and how does that evoke this idea of camouflage and which identities are we encouraged to or allowed to or do we put forward in what context? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, how about we go to the next one? Okay. So that's funny, I kept advancing it when I didn't want to and now when I'm, <laughs> advancing, I'm not advancing it. <laughs> okay. So um, this one is titled, as you can see, as everyone can see, um, I am part of the load not rightly balanced. Um, and I think that I would ask uh, you to, to describe what, what we're looking at. And what we're looking at here. Sorry, you got quiet towards the end there. Sorry, so the question here to start out with, I think in um, encountering this work, uh, I would love to hear from you about the work itself, if you could describe a bit, just what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this is a, uh, a set of wall sculptures. So um, they are, the microbial growth is, is instead of growing off of the wall of let's say the gardener in the last piece, these are actually growing off of framed panels. So uh, in doing that, um, it's, it's referencing painting um, and speaking that language in terms of being a discrete work put on the wall. Um, Each panel is just a little over six feet tall and just a little over three feet wide. Um, and uh, that's mostly, it. part of that is I want the work to be bigger than one person's body um, to sort of dominate the scale of an individual's body. And that's why I started branching over into a two part. And uh, in the somewhat near future, I'm going to be looking at uh, 
making a triptych, a, a three-part uh, wall sculpture so that um, not only is each individual panel confronting you on a bodily scale, but you would actually have to walk through the work to experience the, the full range of it. Um, what else? When I, when I made this piece, I was um, drawing on one of my strongest memories of experiencing an artwork, um, which relates to why uh, it's scaled as it is. So the memory I was drawing on was encountering um, one of Robert Motherwell's Elegy to the Spanish Republic that was at the Albright Knox Gallery in Buffalo. And uh, I, was, I was young, I think I was maybe just barely out of high school and I had no understanding of any of the philosophy or uh, other references that were being used by Motherwell, but nonetheless, it, uh, like I was stopped in my tracks and I actually had to just sit down and um, allow the painting to sort of bleed, bleed out and take over my periphery. Um, and that's, that's something I want, wanted to access in this work and something I want to keep pursuing. Um, I think it connects to polyanthroponemia in that sense, because the idea for that piece is for it to continue growing when the gallery opens up and um, to continue transgressing boundaries, like the boundary between, in this case, in this diptych, um, the boundaries that are being transgressed, you can barely see uh, the microbial growth is actually reaching around the frame. So disobeying that boundary of, of painting. Um, and in, in polyanthroponemia, the boundaries transgressed, transgressed where the ceiling meeting the wall and the bottom of the wall. So um, in that sense, they're, they're quite tightly related. Oh, cool. Thank you for that. I think one thing that um, for folks who have not seen polyanthroponemia in person, that the surface of this is is um, you know not unrelated to the surface of, of yeah. the other work that hmm. what we're looking at in some sense can be related to can be imagined out into the other work. Hmm. Um, so one sort of just very super basic question that I should have asked beforehand <laughs> but didn't is that it looks like we're looking at two images of the same work. Are these are two different pieces actually? Oh gosh, no, they're the same. They're supposed to be different. <laughs> <laughs> So it, um, is, so, so it is a dip, so it is a, dip, a diptych, as you were saying, but we happen to is. be looking at, okay, so that's like a great way to think about multiplicity, isn't it, right? And <laughs> yeah. it's sort of digital migration and like yeah. what, uh, I hadn't particularly planned to ask you about digital stuff, but I think actually this is a great moment to ask about sort of the idea of kind of like replication through digital media and interfaces, where obviously instead of having a in-person conversation at the museum right now we're having this mm. sort of mediated conversation which is of course being recorded and so there's this question I think um, around multiplicity of um, reproduction of, mm -hmm. a, of, of me mechanical or mechanized reproduction mm. as opposed to biological reproduction which is right. also obviously happening in your work so um, I don't know what do you feel like is your relationship to this idea of um, digital reproducibility and how you understand either your work or how your work travels kind of in the world, how, how people encounter it. Yeah, it's, it's another tricky relationship, right? I mean, I can't be independent of technical digital reproducibility. It's an incredible tool. It's, it's um, especially right now, it's a 100% necessary tool unless I just wanna disappear. Um, but at the same time, um, there's nothing like being in the space with a work. Um, there's a presence, there's a, um, there's a, a, yeah, there's sort of an embodied experience that you can't get on a screen. Um, and the way you worded the, the question, the, the mechanical reproduction, I mean, I recently, um, looked at Walter Benjamin's uh, essay on that exact uh, topic. Um, and I have to say, I, I do agree that there's um, a, di a diluting that happens with continuous um, digital or mechanical reproduction. Um, so while it's crucial, uh, 
to staying visible right now. And um, I mean, even just in the nuts and bolts of um, sending applications out and sending my work out to new eyes, uh, it's, it's absolutely necessary, but um, it's, it's a strained relationship. Yeah, totally. I can understand. I mean, I, I think also there's this, um, you know, to keep a Benjamin term in the, in the conversation aura, the idea of the aura of mm -hmm. the individual artwork and whether, mm -hmm. you know, we can think about that in a lot of different ways. But, um, but for me, I feel like your work has a lot to do with its aura, with the physical presence of the object. It's mm -hmm. like, as you reference sort of the full body scale of these works or the um, being overcome by polyanthroponemia, there's very much... Um, a kind of physical gut relationship to these, um, which I think also speaks to their, um, you know, again, this kind of idea of multiplicity, their, their multiple identities as paintings and as sculptures, as objects and as images. Um, I love your notion of one of, of paintings like this that you have to walk through in a sense mm -hmm. and what that sort of, because it also raises this question of front and back. And so as, as paintings or as wall works, both this one and the previous one, there's only a face to them, right? There's a, mm. uh, but it's a, it's a very, um, I would say a thing like face in that mm. it's like material, it's physical. I mean, it's made out of rock clay, which we haven't actually talked about, but like, yeah. it's very like, it's physical presence and what it's made out of is a huge part of the, of the work. And thinking about that, um, how, how you're creating this tension between the physical encounter as an object versus as an image. Mm -hmm. do, uh, I don't know what the question is in there, but do you, <laughs> so I, I guess to what extent do you, are you interested in this, in the, in the, in this idea of these, of works like this functioning both as objects and images at the same time? Yeah, I, I am very interested in that sort of in-between space that they're occupying. Like you said, they're not just images. They're certainly not, um, sculptures as we've been led to understand them um, in terms of three dimensions. Um, I think there's something interesting about transgressing that boundary too. Uh, sculpture versus like 3D versus 2D um, as another line that's being blurred. Um, yeah, there's, there's also just in terms of how it feels in the studio. Um, like I mentioned, this, this wall work um, was for me directly pulling on an experience I had with a painting that just stopped me in my tracks. Um, but at the same time, I don't often think as a, I have a hard time thinking in image. I, I think through moving material. So in that way, um, this work completely makes sense for me uh, as what I need to make. Um, even uh, the image behind me, it's a new series of, of finger paintings. And um, even though it's creating an image, it's a very physical process. So, um, yeah, that's all I have to it say feels, about that. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like you are asking that question actually with the, with the piece behind you about like how, you know, how physical is it? How dimensional, how kind of, how meaty is it in a way? Mm -hmm. um, before we go into the next um, image in, in your third work, I do want to ask a quick question about the, the process and the materials. So we've said just now that this is rock clay. It's rock clay with the surface applied to it. You mm -hmm. use a mold in your work, um, which is a method of reproduction in a way, and that creates sort of multiple. So you don't, you're not into, apart from the image of being of one panel uh, depicted twice, within a panel, you're not individually forming every little aspect of the surface, but you right. use um, uh, you use what we would call a one piece mold to, mm -hmm. um, to create the, to start to, cre to create the texture. So I'm wondering about the idea, and I suppose we could actually go to the, to the next image with this question mm -hmm. too, wondering about this idea. So here the, can you guys see my cursor? I think you can. Um, so we have uh, a shot of the forest. This is an installation work by Magdalene called Intervention Watershed. And the clay component of this, if I'm understanding it correctly, is down through the center here is unfired clay. This is white clay as opposed to the darker clay in the previous works. And here you're, you also have this kind of microbial surface that you've, mm -hmm. that you've made with the help of a mold. So 
thinking about how you make your artwork and what what that opens up for you, what this, what using a mold opens up for you in terms of um, scale and multiplicity, mm -hmm. maybe? I, I mean, in terms of scale, it's, it's a very practical tool. Um, just being able to produce en masse uh, these accumulations, but um, more importantly, uh, it's, for me, it's crucial to erase the individual as much as possible. So to be using a mold um, to mass produce these cells um, is a way for me to take my hand out of it as much as possible and to not literally literally leave my mark on the clay as much. Um, and also thinking about how, although each of us is an individual with individual experiences, um, when you zoom out, there there's a lot of similarity. There's a lot of um, connection between one person's experience to another. Um, yeah, so that's what I like about the molds is the ability to take my hand out of it to a degree, take my individuality out of it to a degree, and dissolve the individual, not dissolve the individual, but hide the individual in the hoard. It's so funny that you talk about erasing or hiding the individual because your work is so like, it's so, like particular in a way, <laughs> and it's also so, it's so made, like it's not like you're clearly not just like stamping them out or anything like yeah. it's not it doesn't have it has very much the sense uh, like of say a, of a painting in a way like of an abstract expressionist painting in the sense of, of it being about the gesture and about the touch and about the individual mark and mm -hmm. so it it's this really great tension between um between the hand or the individual and the absence of the hand or the individual yeah. and you're like right you're right there and it's kind of mind blowing to know that like well you're that you're thinking of this as the the removal or the de-emphasis of of your hand in this work mm -hmm. that's really that's really um fascinating uh, thinking about this piece intervention that we're looking at now so I, I understand that this was um a work that you made a short-term work it's again raw clay so unfired clay that will degrade with water as rain falls on this and that this was um a tree farm actually is that right yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you find the space and what did it kind of, how did it open up a little door in your mind that resulted yeah. in this? Uh, so I did this piece uh, during a residency at the Watershed Center in Maine. And um, on one of the, I think it must have been the first full day we were all there. Uh, we took a little tour around the facilities, but also the land around the facilities. And um, behind the studio building, you only had to walk maybe a couple of minutes and all of a sudden uh, a more natural growth forest opened up onto this expanse of tree farm, abandoned tree farm. And the, the shift in space in the way you experience the space between the natural grown forest, which of course is much more dense, there's much more low growth to this very regimented um, uh, delineation of space, I would say. Uh, was ex like just incredibly striking. Um, and then uh, someone who was walking with me said that they called this the cathedral. And uh, I couldn't get that out of my head. Um, and especially with this vantage point, looking down the, the row of, or looking down the- uh, The nave, I think is the word. Yeah, the, yeah, the nave um, that's created by these trees. I absolutely, uh, just loved that sort of folding of space, the folding of this um, man-made slash natural space versus man-made cathedrals. Um, a lot of my research has been, um, really I would say that the seed of my research has been looking into sublime philosophy as, for me, it's been an option to, um, uh, take a step away from any sort of religious dogma that brings you to a sensation of awe. For me, the sublime was an option for me to um, chase down experiences of awe that reminded me of how small I was in the context of something bigger without having to rely on a specific religion to get me there. Um, and there within sublime philosophy uh, that is so strongly rooted in landscape. And so 
um, I mean, this piece is a pretty clear reference to Richard Long's uh, Landworks, um, which I just adore. <laughs> um, you want to describe those a bit for folks? Who yeah, so what Richard Long is known for, um, the piece specifically that I was thinking about in making this installation was his uh, Line Made Walking, which I think is from the 60s. And as the title suggests, he simply makes a line by walking over grass back and forth, back and forth. Um, and slowly, uh, I can only imagine meditatively, he's making the most subtle mark of his existence in the landscape, um, which after photographing uh, completely disappears. The grass bounces back and it's as though he was never there. Um, and so for me, these interventions, which it's also a, a new-ish series that I, I'm still pursuing, um, it's, it's partly it's about leaving my mark in the landscape, but um, more importantly for me in using the cellular accumulation uh, to create that line, I'm thinking about uh, leaving a mark that is thinking about not just me, but the the species I'm a part of, which keeps accumulating, accumulating, and reaching to the horizon, as a sense of um, what I was looking for was a sense of infinite space, as though the line could just keep going on forever. Um, but even with that amount of accumulation and that long reach that the line has, it is raw clay, and eventually it too is subject to the elements. It disappears. I disappear. We all disappear. <laughs> and that's in some way that connects, I guess for me that connects to the idea of camouflage that, that mm. came up earlier and the notion of erasing and this sort of careful balance between how present you are and how erased you are. It also connects to that to those to the identity questions, like where which identities you put front facing and which you kind of hold back a little bit. Mm. How mm. how sort of the durational part of this piece. Um, it's also, I think, and I love that you brought sublime uh, philosophy and maybe even romanticism into the conversation mm -hmm. too. So early 19th century thinking about sort of the role of the relationship between humans and nature and that you've chosen to, in, to create this work in a place that is not um, fully wild, but that is rational or has been rationalized or has a very, even like in this image particularly, you immediately see that it's not a sort of open forest. Mm -hmm. um, is again a sort of very, seems to me kind of um, interesting and careful calibration of, of the notion of the, the presence of the hand and the physicality mm -hmm. of the hand. Um, <clears throat> that's great. I guess, I, and I love the, the long um, reference. It, you know, it also made me think of Dennis Oppenheim. Do you know his work at all? I know I should know yeah. his work, but well, I can't pull up an image right now. You, you probably come across his name. He was in the same generation of conceptual artists in the late mm. 60s and early 70s. And he did a number of, um, of land-based works where he created lines. And he oh. actually, he's the one who shoveled snow, basically. Like, yes, yes, his yes. artwork was like shoveling snow. And interestingly, yeah. it also, he had a number of pieces that were about the border between Canada yes, and the US. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, this, so one piece he made a, he shoveled a line of snow along the, I think it's the St. John's River, the river that separates Maine from uh, from Canada. Yeah, I can see that image. Can you yeah. picture that? Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. another one of tree growth, kind of implied tree growth rings across yeah. across a frozen river too. So it's yeah. interesting as a Canadian artist and also one based in the Niagara region, which is a border region, um, making this work in Maine and thinking about lines as both sort of being infinite, but at, to what extent they kind of divide and, and link. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we do, so uh, I'll, I'll remind um, folks who are watching that um, questions are great. We would love to have lots of them. We have a handful now. I'm gonna turn to them in just a second. Um, I would, uh, I think I'll ask about watershed before we do that. It's just the last, uh, a last question before we go to, um, to, to quest, last question for me before we go to other questions. And uh, Watershed is a, is a residency program. And so um, I'd love to hear you talk about uh, sort of the role of either your experience at Watershed or your role, the role of residencies in coming to understand your work and develop your, your work 
more mm -hmm. broadly, and then specifically how that sort of maybe getting to this question of identity as a ceramic artist, sort of where the, where the, the meaning or the notion of working with clay fits in. Right. Um, well, starting more broadly, talking about the role of residencies, um, I've done a couple now, and I've got a couple uh, that were, one was put off by COVID. Um, but uh, I, um, for my first residency, I was just really excited to see what that experience was like and to step away from um, my regular everyday life and all the interruptions that come up with that, even as a full-time artist right now. Um, and uh, it was an incredibly productive time because you're taken out of your comfort zone um, or you choose to go out of your comfort zone. I started thinking a little bit more critically about um, why do residencies when I have a studio? I'm lucky enough, I'm privileged enough to have a studio in my house. So why, why would I pursue that? And I think a key function of residencies is leaving your comfort zone um, by choice. Um, and uh, secondly, the important thing for me uh, in going to the watershed residency was meeting other artists. So um, I was invited by Kate Roberts, another ceramic artist, to participate in this residency, which was only two weeks. But um, it was such an incredibly rich time. The, the residency was one of Watershed's Artists Invite Artists programs. Um, and uh, it became such a rich experience. Uh, every day, Kate arranged for um, cocktail discussion hour, which was not very strictly um, set up. It's not like we were having a discussion as you would in a class setting. Um, but uh, that development of community and that exchange of ideas and that um, experience of different ways of thinking about work, it was like, I know not every residency is like that, but that was a beautiful experience. It was incredible. And um, yeah, yeah, I'm hoping to uh, another, uh, item that got canceled or postponed, let's say, um, by COVID was a show that I had organized for some of the artists that were at that residency. So trying to continue to extend that, uh, that piece of community that started there in Maine. Um, so that's, I mean, like I said, I don't, I know not every residency is like that and very much oriented towards building community and discussion, but that's something I, I really hunger for. Um, like I said, I'm very privileged to have my own studio, but there's an isolation in that too. Um, For sure. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Finding ways to access community and, and also creating my own community um, in different ways is really important to me now that um, I'm not in grad school. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which actually is a great lead into one of our questions, which, um, which uh, highlights that we do have a, a work of yours in the Gardner collection, which is a mm. figurative piece um, that is, uh, I think it's from 2010, but I might be wrong. Um, and, uh, and so the question is about um, how that figurative work, which is so different from the work that you're making now, like how they relate to each other. And um, how did your, so the questioner asks, when did, you, when did your practice start to change and what brought about that shift? Yeah. Um, it is, it, it looks like quite a dramatic shift, but when I have looked back through my, through the catalog of works that I was doing between um, the time where I was making the torso series, which is the piece that's in the collection, the Gardener collection, and to now, there have been many little baby steps to get to this work. Um, so how does that early work relate? Um, I think there's a spiritual quest, honestly, that links both of them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, with that figurative work, um, I was thinking about uh, a feeling of entrapness, uh, entrapment in looking for some sort of understanding of how an individual, how one fits into um, 
whatever is going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think even it's just like an entrapment in trying to understand anything. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> like, yes. Um, so that's where that work was. Uh, but so I went to, I started grad school in the fall of 2016. And even from 2014, I started becoming um, a bit disenchanted with looking at it from an individual experience. Um, I think that figurative work, my earlier figurative work, was really engaging in the emotional landscape of an individual as opposed to um, looking at the landscape we create when we are all combined together. Um, and so uh, a lot of that work where I was exploring how I move out from the figurative work that was focused on the individual emotional experiences to this work, it, it wasn't, um, uh, what am I trying to say? I, it wasn't, I didn't put it out in the public eye as much. So um, to me, I can see the baby steps that came from that early work and led to this work, um, but it wouldn't show up in Google. <laughs> um, um, but in terms of um, how grad school helped me to speed up those baby steps, uh, before I went back to school, before I went to grad school, I knew, like I said, that I was becoming disenfranchised with the idea of looking at just an individual because it just, it wasn't getting at all I wanted to get at. It wasn't getting at um, the incredible force that we can be for good or ill when we combine. Um, and then grad school allowed me to just really sink into some research and um, be forced to make at a certain pace that just drove those baby steps to a, a quicker pace, which is something I couldn't have created for myself, even with umpteen right. residencies. Interesting. So you've actually sort of started to touch on one of our other questions that's come in, which is um, asking how much time you put into research in, as part of your studio practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this year I've had the privilege to be a full-time artist. I took a break from teaching secondary school, um, took a personal leave to focus on the studio, and the schedule I set up for myself was mornings were for research. So um, whether it was sort of flitting back and forth without super firm direction in terms of continuing to pursue sublime philosophy and environmental writing. Um, or, or So whether it was very strict, strictly driven research or whether it was sort of bouncing around and seeing what would come my way and what would land. Uh, and then the afternoons have been dedicated to studio time. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there it gets a bit fuzzy because research isn't just reading. <laughs> um, something I love uh, in the studio, my studio time is research, both in terms of researching how the material will behave um, in different formats, and also um, the still rational side of research with um, listening to podcasts and audiobooks, which I just can't get enough of. Uh, I, do, I do love the picture of you like reading um, reading a 19th century philosophy all morning yeah. and then like starting yeah. to work <laughs> to make your stuff in the afternoon. That's pretty Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, fantastic. yeah. Uh, um, so I'd like to I'd like to um, ask uh, sort of roll together two more questions that we've had um, from participants that um, that uh, are asking about your material choices. So your use of raw clay in particular, and so um, the questions have to do with. Um, are asking you to speak to um, the use of unfired clay in uh, sort of how it relates to your conceptual and poetic ideas, the kind of physical challenges of working with um, raw clay, and then how it relates to your idea of the land and your kind of connection, your, your connection to the sense of place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, I use unfired clay uh, to reflect on my individual mortality and our uh, transients as a species. Um, there's, we weren't always here. I doubt we will always be here. <laughs> uh, so that's the most important reason for me using unfired clay. And then um, 
connecting to the difficulties of using such a heavy material uh, in my sculpted in my wall sculptures and the installation at the gardener um, by necessity there's an armature underlying that work uh, that allows me to build up volume without necessarily building mass um, so for example um, one of the largest components of the installation at the gardener I think must have weighed 60 pounds or so um, which is right leaning up against the limit of what my husband and I can lift together. Uh, <laughs> and that's the same with the wall sculptures there. And that's part of the limitation of the scale that I have there, which is a little frustrating to me. Um, I mean, what I would love to be able to do is build a monumental wall sculpture on site that just stays for however long, but, um, the limitation I have right now with my wall sculptures is they do have to be able to come off the wall uh, with the combined strength of me and my husband and then stick it in a U-Haul or something and take it away. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. These are like, these are the, right, these are things that not everybody realizes when they're looking at your work. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Jay DeFeo uh, with her <sighs> rose. It, um, yeah. So for those who don't know, Jay DeFeo, um, made this incredible, what I will call a wall sculpture, um, out of just years of layers of paint and I think placer and placer, mica yeah. and the, the legend of her having to um, get the window of her apartment cut out bigger so that <laughs> some sort of lift or something could remove it. Yeah. Oh my God. I just love that so much, but I don't want to have to cut out my windows. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So anyone who's listening, who's, who uh, runs an art center or a museum or some other kind of exhibition space, yeah, Magdalene needs like yeah. a nice big wall to take over yeah. and to keep. So. <laughs> wow. This is great. I'm going to super quickly answer one final question that we've had, which is whether the piece in the museum, Polyanthropoponymia, uses molds. And yes, you did use uh, molds Absolutely. again for like little segments of that not you know a giant piece so mm -hmm. um well not surprisingly we've been talking for more than 20 minutes, <laughs> 20 minutes so um but it has been super interesting and fun for me to um to speak with you again and to hear more about both the work at the museum and also other work and some of your thinking about it so thank you so much for thank you it's been a pleasure yeah, it's really been fun. And thanks to everyone who's been joining us. Again, this is our first one. Was, um, I don't know yet that we've had any major huge ages, <laughs> so I hope it went smoothly for everyone. Um, I do want to say that this is, or kind of remind everyone, let me see, that this is a um, an ongoing series. So we are um, anticipating, uh, we have two, we have a number that are coming up. So next week, we have two that are coming. We'll have a studio visit on Tuesday, the 23rd, same time, 1pm, with uh, an amazing artist named Linda Sorman, a Canadian artist who you probably know, Magdalene, yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Linda, now based in New York, she's going to be walking us through um, her studio, which should be really fun seeing some work in progress. That will be on Instagram Live. So again, that's Tuesday, the 23rd at 1 p.m. And then on Thursday, say a week from today, 1 p.m., we'll be speaking with uh, Sharif Bey. Um, works with Clay and other media, and we'll be thinking about his work within the context of quiet. So I hope everyone um, can join us and tell your friends. And Magdalene, again, it's been great. Thank you so much. This has Thank been you. really fun and cool. So be well, make lots of work. Stay Thank safe. you. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.